All right, great. Well, let's let's get uh, straight to the first question. So, um, Bria had a really interesting question. I'm just going to read the question in full because um, she makes a lot of good points. So she says, I hope that you're not literally losing sleep, but I'm interested in hearing your thoughts more broadly. Um, beyond the usual suspects that already exert a global burden, what relatively unknown or less prevalent pathogen do you think presents the greatest potential pandemic threat? What do you think about the global state of preparation for detecting and controlling an outbreak attributed to that pathogen? So I'd just like to open the discussion here a bit more broadly, not um, not just to novel emerging diseases, but in general, what is this? You know, what keeps you up at night, either because you're terrified or because you're excited? <laughs> um, and um, what's what's the state of affairs? What do you think? You know, is, is the world prepared for whatever it is that keeps you uh, awake at night? So, who wants to give the first shot? Are you looking at me? I guess. Uh, okay, so I, I can't say I actually. Um, kept awake at night worrying about it, but during the day I worry an awful lot about uh, antibiotic resistant uh, bugs in hospitals. Uh, and I'm getting more and more worried about that. And uh, that's because I had the good fortune to work in a hospital for a few days earlier this year, an American hospital, uh, where I saw people die from infections that just couldn't be treated, that were easily treatable when I was at college. Uh, and that to me is just an amazing, well I had a big impact. And then you can see the physicians, uh, they struggle with these. They have a battery of drugs and they do the testing and then they're trying to find a drug for which they will work. And they get down to the last one or two and sometimes they run out. And uh, you look, okay, well, what's the next thing coming along the line? Where's the new drugs? And you can see a drug development pipeline which is just running out. The economics don't work. Uh, the bugs are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, I don't know. It's, um, People forget how much antibiotics really do for us. I and mean, it's not just when you get sick, it's also when you get a hip transplant or a heart valve operation. There's a huge amount of drug use going on to prevent people getting infected in the first place. And if those stop working, medicine as we know, it's not going to go. So, uh, to me, that's the, um, that's the thing that I, I worry about the most. And I think one of the interesting questions is going to be when I get my hip transplants and so forth, will we have run out of these drugs? Uh, we'll just be left to at the moment. What they do when they really get pushed is they use drugs with hideous side effects. They're the things you wouldn't bring out if there mm. was anything else that could work. We've all been raised in this era where, you know, for a few dollars you can just treat things and you don't think about it again. Well, that era is passing. Good point. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to say that I don't stay awake at night worrying about what the next infection is going to be, but I am excited by the huge amount of data that we're starting to get. Because just a few years ago, we had no data at all. But I'm also worried about the zoonotic diseases. So those are diseases that come from wildlife and spill into humans. Diseases we know nothing about whatsoever. Classic example of that, of course, was the SARS epidemic, which came through a very circassious route from bats to civets to humans and then spread around the world. But we did a very good job in controlling it. But nobody, nobody would have guessed that a coronavirus would have done that. Nobody would have guessed that the Hendra Nipah viruses would have had the impact they have in killing human beings. I mean, how comes in Western, sorry, Eastern Australia that people are dying because they're being exposed to a virus that comes from bats to horses to them? So I think there is still concern in my part about the sort of unknown and knowing that there's some disease out there. So we, we do need surveillance in that respect, but I'm not convinced that surveillance is really going to give us the answer. I do think we need to understand what we're looking at, and I think we need to be able to do the, to do the right sort of monitoring, but it's not easy. Are we prepared? Partly. Partly. I think we're much more prepared than we were mm. 10, 15 years ago. Certainly better prepared than we were when HIV spread across the world. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of interest <coughs> and excitement in the, in the research world, the public health world, and the popular culture about new and emerging threats, uh, antibiotic resistance, new and emerging viruses. Um, again, I don't necessarily stay up that night, at, at night that much, but I'm, I, tend to be, <laughs> I tend to be 
uh, concerned primarily about um, classic and old threats, things that have been around for quite a while, but are but we that for which we think we have controls, for which we have actually really quite good controls, but they manage to persist, and that, and understanding how pathogens manage to persist in the face of controls, I think, is a is a real challenge. Um, and so I spent a lot of time working on childhood infections and measles in particular, and. Uh, I think the estimates last year are, are some, somewhere in the vicinity of 158,000 children worldwide died from measles, which is, a, which is a, a virus for which we've had a vaccine for the last uh, 50 years, right? An effective vaccine. There's been no evolution. There's been no, there's been no change in the, in the efficacy of the vaccine. It's just a matter of uh, the dynamics of this pathogen changing as a, as a consequence of our control and becoming harder and harder to track down and chase. And I think you know, if you look worldwide, we've got somewhere on the order of one in five, uh, one in five children um, in the developing world are, are dying due to uh, infectious causes that are, that are currently treatable or, or preventable with, with available technologies. And I think trying to understand what are the mechanisms that allow these pathogens to persist in the same way that we think about how, um, you know, Pest, you know, uh, pests or weeds manage to evade control or, you know, I mean, this is a classic population dynamics question that how do, things, how, how do uh, populations maintain themselves when their abundances get to be really low? Are they hiding out in the, in the interstices of, uh, you know, of, the, of the population or are they uh, undergoing these persistent uh, these cycles? And how do we understand and predict those changes so that we actually can um, affect uh, efficient control to really chase them to the ends of the earth? I, w I would think that one thing that concerns me and has concerned me greatly over the last two and a half years is the threat to our global food supply, particularly agricultural crops, plants. And so this comes about because I've worked almost exclusively in rainforests over the last eight years. And every time you walk out of a rainforest, you walk into a farm. And I had a great good fortune to be traveling around with Harry Evans, who is one of the global leaders in understanding emerging diseases, but not in humans, but in plants. And, and looking at this gentleman who is almost 70 now and seeing that we're not training a cadre of scientists like him, I'm rather concerned that we don't have in place an understanding to deal with the next threat of diseases. And also speaking as an Irishman who is where a quarter of the population has been destroyed by a plant pathogen, it's very easy to imagine when we establish monoculture systems with very little genetic diversity that diseases can emerge. And in the mid 70s, we had a rather telling example of this, which is uh, the almost complete destruction of the cassava crop. And this is a plant from South America, which was introduced to West Africa, and it was extremely useful and fed the global food, suppl food supply of 250 million people in 27 countries. And two pests were introduced, and almost overnight, they destroyed the crop. And the world rallied around in the mid 70s, 1973 it started, and they found solutions. And speaking to Hans Herren, who won the World Food Prize for this, I spoke to him recently about this, and he said, if that happened today, we wouldn't be in a position to rally the world in the same way and find solutions. Um, and now cassava feeds 500 million people. So the, the threats to our food supply is something that, that truly worries me. I thought uh, that was very, uh, very interesting that um, here's uh, David who studies zombie diseases, and he's he, uh, before we started this uh, uh, filming, he said that the thing that kept, uh, kept him awake at night was the cassava, what's it called? The cassava mealybug and green The cassava mealybug, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there, that pers perspective on, on uh, the zombies of the world. So I think, uh, I think you guys have covered most of the things. So I, I do, uh, I, um, so I do want to, uh, to share, I guess, uh, Peter, an other sentiment that, so, so I think in terms of preparedness, we're probably not quite there, but certainly the level of eternal vigilance now is, uh, is much, much greater than it was 50 years ago. And I think, you know, it's an enormous testimony to our level of focus on the problems that we managed to nip a lot of these things in, in, in the butt, like the SARS, the MRSA, and a variety of them. So, so it does seem like uh, like we are more prepared than before, but then of course, well, it's only 40 years ago that uh, HIV came out of the jungles and suddenly kind of popped out and, and managed to sneak in with, uh, um, and was suddenly a, a pandemic. And so hopefully that can't happen again, but uh, 
So what, if, are, you know, so what if the 1918 pandemic flu hit us today? Mm. So in 1918, this flu broke out. Remind, was it 15 million people it killed across the world? Yeah, between 15 and 100. Mm. Huge number of people actually died. If that emerged tomorrow, do you think we have the... Do you think we have the surveillance? Do you think we have the methodology to nip it in the bud? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it would have some impact. It depends where it... Well, we expect it to come in Southeast Asia, don't mm -hmm. we? Yeah. And I think well, we would be... A lot of them came out of Mexico, so the, yeah. it's yeah. the swine well, H1N1. Came exactly. I mean, I think flu is an interesting case. You know, on the one hand, obviously it's a completely different world and something new comes out. Within a, an extremely short time, we have the genetic sequence of, mm -hmm. of that pathogen. The whole world is alerted through through the web, social media, what have you. Um, so, so to some extent, you know, these things will obviously help. I think what worries me sometimes when when I read, you know, and do the research is how little we still don't know about something mm. so you know so common as the flu. I mean, we still. Mm. We're still actually not completely sure what the dominant transmission route is of the flu, whether it's the sort of person to person or to yeah. what extent it's actually airborne and, and you know you can infect other people by indirectly infecting the room, so to speak. These things we don't know. We know a lot yeah. about the flu on a you know fundamentally detailed molecular level, but some of these things we don't know. And the other thing, I guess, that worries me and that a lot of people alluded to in the forums is not so much perhaps the biology, but you know, what if something really hits and is, is starting to, you know, we're starting to realize that we have a problem that is hard to control. What, is, what are the societal aspects, the economic aspects going to be, yeah. you know, as shown in, you know, Every, every other year there's either a movie sure. or a new book about that <coughs> contagion, perhaps most famously in recent, in recent history, where the real worry was actually not so much from the, from the pathogen, but, but, uh, but by how people reacted to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when it comes to SARS, actually, that, that's a really good one. Do you think we really sort of understood? Do, do you think we really had it under control, or do you think we just, we just got lucky and it went away? So I think the WHO were amazingly proactive there. Right. I was really, in, it was incredibly impressive how basically they took the courage to close down the airports and, right. and stop the travel. Yes, SARS got to Canada, it killed a few people there, but it never really hit the Western world badly, and they were able to keep it under control. Um, I don't know if somebody would have that same courage today to do that. Right. It really does need a lot of courage to say we're going to have a global impact on the economy. I think your economic arguments are really interesting, but you then think back to 1918, virology was in its total infancy. They didn't actually, they did, well, we didn't have electron microscopes at that time. And now the technology has really well, blossomed. We, we didn't we have antivirals at all. We, you know. Absolutely. But we, didn't I, even know what, <coughs> we didn't even know what it was. But I think we would, it was lucky with SARS. I think it was really a close front yeah. thing. I and if you think about it, it's got to get into places where containment is possible. Once it's got out of a situation like mm. Canadian cities, and it's got into places where you can't contain people, mm. like large parts of Africa or South, South America, mm. I think it would have run away with itself, actually. Mm. I think we would have had a total disaster. Even with flu, seasonal flu, mm. we wait each season for yeah. enough immunity to burn up in the population, build up in the population for it to die out. We don't contain flu. We yeah. can't contain flu. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it was close run. The flu is also flu. Just the just the biology of flu, right? It's the the infection is acute. It's fairly detectable, yes. right? The symptom the symptomology is is well understood. I think that as a as a consequence, it, it has it has the classic characteristics of this violent, visible outbreak, right? That that for which we can generate interest, we can generate uh, um, you know enough. Uh, 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 fear or concern within the population to, to mount a response and do these kinds of um, uh, you know have these kinds of reactions. I think you know I think the, the case of HIV is a, is a really good example. There's something for which there was a long latent period that actually allowed a long a, a, a fair bit of spread before the, the the disease process itself was detectable. Right, there were lots of people that were already infected mm -hmm. but not diseased by the time we by the time we actually were able to track this thing down. And I think that that. If you're, you know, if you're looking for, you know, the next 
the next ma you know, major pandemic, I think it's, it's largely going to be a, a consequence of those kinds of pathogens that have these large latent periods for which by the time we detect it, there's a huge amount of this, you know, there's a huge amount of infection that has already spread through the population, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. I, so, you know, so I, I tend to think of things like, um, you know, like Chagas disease, for which, which is a vector-borne disease, which is um, uh, prevalent in, in South America currently, but there's a, there's a long asymptomatic period, this very mild disease initially, but a long asymptomatic period that then manifests itself with severe disease later mm -hmm. on in life. And so unless, you, you know, unless you're looking for, you know, exp explicitly looking for this thing within the population, there's the potential that it could have spread a long ways in, in, you know, in, a, in, in a mechanism that's analogous to what we saw with, this, with the spread of something like HIV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think no question, if you get infectiousness before you get symptoms, then it's trouble. Yeah, that's really yeah. big trouble. Absolutely. Good. Well, uh, but I guess also speaking to your point, I mean, probably the reason why we got a TB pandemic now that's burning through right. the world very slowly and, you know, not getting much attention is because TB is one of those things. Yeah. It's got yeah. a latent period that can be decades yeah. Yeah. And, and just slowly build up a lot of infected but not yet infectious individuals in the population. And so because the the, the um, symptom, very little symptoms, there's no drug treatment because you know, there's mm -hmm. normally just passive surveillance when, when people come in sick in the hospitals. And but the TB pandemic has been running, I guess, not for 30 years, <laughs> <laughs> as somebody pointed out on the forum, which I, I, I my error in additions in my <laughs> one of my movies, but since at least since uh, 1993, so 20 years. Uh, there's been a, 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 this smoldering uh, TB pandemic. The other thing about TB is it's a disease of the poor. Mm. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, in thinking about the future pandemics, we're finding that a globally connected world through Twitter and Facebook has a remarkable effect on the effect on the movement of political ideas. And as individuals are able to crowdsource information about diseases within a country, we do know that historically countries have tried to reduce the information flowing out of that country on diseases within their borders. And it will be rather interesting to see how Twitter and Facebook and other examples of social media will play in, in making the world more aware of emerging diseases in a way that the world community can respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the benefits and probably something we have seen um, to some extent in, in the H7N9 outbreak mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the response of the Chinese government was really fast mm -hmm. and actually some reports came out through the sort of Twitter equivalent in China okay. before, before it was officially acknowledged. So I think it, at the same, the other side of that is that of course people were eating a lot of wildlife mm -hmm. in China when mm -hmm. SARS and things came up and now you go to those markets and you just don't see the wildlife. Oh. Apparently, it's the same in Africa as well, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, but if you want to get hold of gorilla or chimpanzee yeah, or yeah. civic cat to eat, yeah, yeah. apparently it's all gone underground. Yeah, so yeah. now it's much more difficult to control. Okay. And they think the yes. consumption rate and the killing of those animals continues mm -hmm. and people are still being, still being exposed. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, well, obviously we could talk about this for hours, but let's, let's move on 